We're excited that you're here with us. We're in the second installment of this, uh, this new series. It's, it's really a character study of the person of John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist is a unique character of the New Testament. There's not a lot of verses um, really compared to, to some characters in the Bible, but he has a lot, I believe, a lot to teach us because he is... In a lot of ways, he is a model for the New Testament Christian, the, those who follow Christ. He was the first uh, person to ever proclaim the Messiah. He was the first to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the way that, we, uh, that he was, and really was honestly a model for us of what it looks like to live for Jesus. He had so much authority, so much humility, and this is the reason why we're calling this series Faceless, because in our culture where everyone is so obsessed with their face, we even got social media that is Facebook. It's all about, it's like getting your face out there and you just look on the walls, man, everybody's duck lip face and stuff. So it, it's in, in our culture, everyone's like, like, it's really about me and trying to make my way. John is contradictory and different and He's, he's like, I don't care if you even know my name. I'm just a voice in the wilderness preparing the way of the way. You don't need to know me. You need to know him. You need to know Jesus. And there's a lot that we can learn from this person of John the Baptist. So last week in part one, if you miss it, you're, you, you should go back and listen to it or watch it online or on iTunes because what I'm going to be sharing today is very connected to part one. In part one, we talked about destiny, but really... It was, it was about our identity because the, the big thought was, unless you know your identity, you can't walk in your destiny. So you have to know who you are, really who you are not and who God says you are. That's so key to, to walking in your God-given destiny. Very important to where we're going today. Today's title, the theme, if you will, that shows up in John the Baptist's life that we're going to study is Unique. Unique. John the Baptist was a unique dude. God had a, a he, was, he was just different, okay? And I'm not talking about different and unique like you would use it sometimes where you're like to describe your coworker or that relative. You know what I'm saying? They're unique. You know what I mean? That's not the kind of unique that I'm talking about. I, you are uniquely created by God, different by design. You are, you're not even just one in a million. You are one of a kind, do you know that? There is no one like you. There is no one who ever existed that was like you or ever will be created after you that will ever be like you. We're all wired differently on purpose. Some people think, they think like, like well, I'm just average. I'm not, I don't really have much to offer. I'm, I'm just, uh, and I'm telling you, the devil lies to us and says, you don't matter. You're not, you're not, and that's a lie of the enemy. God created you unique different to give him glory in a way that only you can give him glory. You were created. So just by kind of an example, raise your hand if you're here today and you are an extrovert. How many extroverts? Created by God, extrovert. You just kind of, uh, you like people, crowds, stuff like that. Not very many people. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. How many introverts? Introverts. Wow. Wow. No wonder I don't get amens. I don't feel bad now. I thought it was my preaching. It's actually not me. It's you. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Just kidding. But God did that. God, God wired you that way. How about this? How many of you are huggers here? Where are the huggers at? Give me the hug. Bring it in. Bring it in, right? How many here are like plywood? You're in my space. Oh, it's this awkward, right? Okay, that's just different. God made us all different. How about worship? How do you worship? More demonstrative? Demonstrative worship? Lift hands, sing, jump, okay? How many are more contemplative, reserved, reserved, reserved. Yep. You guys ain't even raising your hand either. Like, I, just, I just don't do it. I ain't going to do it. Right? <laughs> I just don't go there. <laughs> well, God made us kind of that way, really uniquely. Like even we do vacations differently. Some of us like vacation. It's really busy, scheduled. It's just, and some of us like vacation that's like secluded. I get away from people and I don't want to talk to people or see people. And God, God did that on I just, I want you to know God did that on purpose, and I, and I want you today, what I want you to do is to uh, lead you to this place, really, to embrace the uniqueness that is you, because God created you very different and very unique. So today, what I want to do in using John the Baptist and some themes that show up in his story is to help you discover today the unique you that God created, and to actually embrace that 
and be who God has created you to be. I mean, do you guys know that God has a unique vision for your life? There's, there is a unique dream. Like you, we studied last week, and I told you, it connects, it connects. You got to go listen to it. We studied last week that God had you in mind before he created you, that you were the focus of his love. He created you because he loves you. He actually had, he had a thought of who you were and who you would be and do. He had a dream and a vision for your life. And what I want to do today is to help connect you. I want to help try to lead you towards that place, that, that unique vision and dream that God had in mind for your life. You're unique. Uni- unique means exclusive or rare, uncommon. Um, it, it means there's no one else like you, not typical, unusual. John the Baptist fits like all those definitions, okay? He was a unique dude. God used, though, the, this fundamentally unique individual. Remember, 400 years of silence, and now he uses the uniqueness of this character that he is called to proclaim the way John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3, in your notes, are up here on the screen, you guys. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So not, he wasn't, already he's positioned in a unique place. He's not in the synagogues. He's not even in the city of Judea. He's in the wilderness preaching and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He's positioned differently. Matthew chapter 3 continues, verse 4. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. Uh, <laughs> you guys thought fanny packs looked weird. You know what I mean? <laughs> this guy, I'm t- and by the way, they're coming back. You guys know that, the fanny pack? I, I was in L.A. just the other day, and all the, uh, they got them fanny packs and stuff. It's, it, it starts in L.A., it'll come down here. It takes about a year or two, just watch, just watch. Some of y'all making fun of, you know, people wearing fanny packs. You're going to be wearing fanny packs here in about a year or two. It just, but this dude, probably not go this far, right? The camel hair, leather belt. That's a bit too far, John. I ain't going there. He's just different, man. He, his food was locusts and wild honey. Um, now, John was very clearly unique, but guess what? So are you and I. God created us very unique, and people in this day and age, they tried to disqualify John. Religious leaders and the people, they they said, no, you don't, you're not from where we are. You don't know what we know. You don't look and talk like we talk, and they would try to disqualify John. Even, you know what? Some of us, some of us try to disqualify ourselves because we don't look like or talk like or sound like or come from and, and we try to say, we try to disqualify ourselves from God using us because here, look at this next slide, not in your notes or anything, but our definition of usable, it, it, it hinders our desire to be used. Some of us have a really bad definition of usable because all of us want to make a difference. I believe we all want our life to count. But when we start trying to define what that looks like to be usable by God, then we go, whoa, because if it has to look like him on the stage, I don't know if I can do that. Or if it has to look like this or this, and it hinders our desire to want to even be used by God. So let me, let me kind of unpack some of these lies that really, that disqualify us. And John could have got trapped into any of these lies from the enemy to try to disqualify him from being who God has created and called, from living the God dream that, that God gave him, the vision that God had on his life. And honestly, some of us today are probably disqualifying or letting others disqualify us as well. Here, write these down. Number one, the lies that disqualify. Number one is my place disqualifies me. Where we say, well, you don't know where I came from. I come from a broken home. I come from nothing and no one. I come from the hood, pastor. I come from the ghetto. You don't even know where I, man, God can't use me because of the place, my place disqualified. I wasn't raised in church. I don't know the church stuff and the, and the Bible stuff and all that. So God can't use me. God uses people that kind of were raised in it, know it. I'm just kind of, and, and John knows what that's like. Look at verse 1 again. In those days, it says, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He wasn't preaching and teaching in the temples. He was in the wilderness. And the people that came to be ministered to, the religious leaders tried to disqualify him because of where he was. They tried to do the same thing to Jesus. They said, hey, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Anything good at all? Don't we know his, his, isn't he a carpenter's son? We know his brothers and his sisters. And they were saying, he's just 
qualified. I even know this. I mean, I was not raised in church. I didn't know the politics, the policies, the people, the procedures. And so when the Lord saved me and called me to ministry, there was a lot of people who was like, who's this guy? This guy didn't have to go through what we went through and know what we went. He didn't have to go through all the camps and the stinking overnight stuff and, the, and all that. And I, I, didn't, I just was on fire for God. And there were people, honestly, before we even started Discovery Church, it was, it was some of the people that were with us, the pastors that were with us, it was, we got a lot of like, you know, noses up at us because of who I am and where I come from because I wasn't one of them. <laughs> just, I wasn't raised as part of them. And it was, it was honestly hard to find someone to kind of give us a covering and, and, and start Discovery Church, but we would not be deterred. But some of us are allowing the place we come from to disqualify us from being who God has called us to be. Here's the second lie, and that is my person disqualifies me, where we might say something like, well, you don't know who I am. You don't know who I am. I, I, I am a, and, and the Bible is full of people who, who like did some bad stuff. And, and God used in great ways. And, and honestly, even in the Old Testament, they were given names to kind of give them an identity of, of who they were or would be. It was almost prophetic. And, and honestly, there were some terrible names that people were given and was spoken over their life in the Old Testament. Names like Ichabod. Ichabod. You don't hear that name, very, thankfully, Ichabod very much. But Ichabod literally means, and they named their kid this. Check this out. The glory of God has departed. Just took one look at that kid and said, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. God must not be on this. No, I'm just, but that's, isn't that terrible to just speak that identity over someone? You guys know the story of Gideon where Gideon, God calls him a mighty warrior. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm the least in my family. I'm the weakest in Manasseh. I am nobody, God. Or, or Rachel, Jacob's wife, who died giving birth to her child, named her child Ben-Oni which is translated, the son of my sorrow and pain. Her dying breath to her kid was to give him an identity of, you're the son of my sorrow and pain. And so, so Jacob, Rachel dies. Jacob, the father, says, no, no, no. You are, he changes his name. says, no, that's not who you will be. That's not going to be your name. You're not going to be called that. You're going to be called Benjamin, the son of my right hand. And the right hand was the hand of blessing, the hand of multiplication. At the end of a father's life, he would lay his right hand on his son, and he would say, everything that God has given me and blessed me with, let it be multiplied over in your life. Continue the legacy that God started in me. Look, your person, who you are, does not disqualify you. You need to know who you're not. That's why you need to know your identity, who you're not and who you are. Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, again here with John the Baptist his clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around. That alone would make a lot of us disqualify him because he just didn't look like us. He don't look like us. He's not, he's not in our circles, and we would disqualify him. Here's the third lie, and that is my past disqualifies me. My past, well, you don't know what I've done, pastor. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the people that I've hurt. You don't, you don't know the places that I've been, the mistakes that I've made. Can I tell you something, you guys? There is no amount of messing up, hurts, disappointments, running or wrong that you could ever do to make Jesus love you any less. Amen. Your past does not qualify you. Just because you took a detour doesn't mean you don't have a destiny. Amen, somebody? You're going to learn, you're gonna learn that, that your past, all that stuff, the good, the bad, the ugly, every, every bit of it, it didn't disqualify you. It actually prepared you. It uniquely prepared you. God, God grabs all of it. He, he doesn't waste anything in your life. He grabs all of it, and he's going to turn it around. If you let him, he'll turn it around for his good and glory. Amen, you guys? Amen. But we go, oh, my past. You don't, you don't know. Matthew 3, 4, John, was, his food was locusts and wild honey, the Bible says. Yeah, that menu would be enough for us to disqualify John right there. And people are watching what's on your menu. People know what you've done. People try to remind you what you've done in your past, but your past does not define who you are and who God has called you to be. Um, John could have let any of these disqualify him, but he didn't. So here's, I want to take a, a, just a, a little detour real quick and, and kind of share with you someone in the Bible who actually let his past 
his person, who he was, and, and his, his, where he was from, his place, disqualify him. Moses, in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, God called him. God had a dream, a unique destiny on Moses. And he was, he was going to be and was the deliverer of Israel, God's people, from the bondage of, of slavery in Egypt. But Moses, because he let his past, because he let his person, and because he let his place disqualify him, the anointing that was supposed to be on him was put on Aaron. Okay, listen, listen you guys. His destiny was the deliverer of Israel, and he was the deliverer of Israel. But the path to get there was a lot harder for Moses. Your destiny, if you follow God, your destiny will come to pass. God will move you towards your destiny if you follow him. But the path you take is up to you. You could take, you could take a hard road if you, dis, if you allow the enemy or yourself or others to disqualify you from who God has called you to be. And Moses did. So here, here are four statements. Let me give you really quickly in your notes, four statements that will, that will actually keep you from fulfilling your unique design. Number one is Moses said this. This is Exodus 3 and 4. Moses said, who am I? Who am I? God, I mean, I, uh, you don't, some of you don't think much of yourself. You don't have a good self-image. You're measuring yourself by yourself. You're measuring yourself by your place, your person, or your past, and you got the wrong definition of who you are. And you need to know who God says you are. He said, who, who am I? And then the second thing he said to God was, well, what if they? What if they? What if they reject me? What if they, don't, what if they don't listen to me? What if they don't like what I say? He was more concerned about what people think. And if you put more weight upon other people's opinions than on God's opinions, then you'll stay on the sidelines when God wants you to get in the game. You'll become a prisoner locked by self-made fear. Other people's opinions can sidetrack you from God's purpose for your life. The third statement he said was, I have Never. I've never done that. I've never spoken for the people before. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good teacher. I'm not a good leader. I'm not good. I, I have, I've never done that. So I'm, I'm, that's outside of my comfort zone, outside of what's normal for me, God. I, I, I hear you, but I, I, that's, that's not. And then last he said, just, how about you just use someone else, God? That's the scary thing what Moses, Moses said, you know what? Not me. Use somebody else. And God says, okay, I'll put the anointing on Aaron that was supposed to be on you, you're still going to be the deliverer, but the anointing, the gift, is going to be put on Aaron. You have a unique dream, vision, that God has for your life. Remember, there's, there's 400 years of, of silence, of no vision and voice, when John the Baptist is coming on the scene. And, and God uniquely chooses an individual who just does not fit the mold to declare the coming of a new age and a new kingdom. He, Jesus speaks about um, John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11. As, John the, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about him. And he said, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out there to see? Was it just a normal guy you went out there? A man dressed in fine clothes? That's not, that's not what drew you to John. It wasn't his fine clothes. It wasn't his eloquent talk. It wasn't with who he knew and, and what he was about and where he came from. That's not what it was. No. Those who wear fine clothes are in the king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet is he. Now, John, I'm not saying be different just for the sake of being different. I mean, that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm kind of advocating here. Don't, don't get caught up. And you know, in our culture today, people are just getting caught up in being different for different sake. People that just try to be different for different sake are either insecure or they don't know who they are. Don't be different for different sake. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is know who you are in Christ. Be the unique you that God has called you to be because God's version of you is the best version of you. That's, that's the best version of you there is, is God's version of you. And when you do that, just like John the Baptist, he was unique, absolutely. He was a little out there, but people are drawn to, to authenticity. When you're not, trying to, you're not trying to put on or be someone you're not, you're just, you know who you are. You know what God has called you to do. And that's what they were drawn to in John. It wasn't his fine clothes. It wasn't his how he talked or who he knew. It was the authentic him that God created. 
It was who he was. He was, he was just authentically who he was meant to be. Look at Luke chapter 3, not in your notes. People responded to that, to that uniqueness that was in John. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. You thought the messages here were strong. John, John punched them in the mouth, okay? He's like, you brood. And they were like, give me more. It's so good, John. You, you brood of vipers. Who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And that's what John's main message was. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then what happens, he gives, in Luke chapter 3, he gives this message. And then three different groups of people actually come up to him after this message. It's really cool. Because now remember, John is a model of, of, of the voice of God now, which is now the church. It's now us. Of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Of what it means to be the proclaimer of Jesus. He is a model for you and I, what happens when God, when people encounter the uniqueness that is inside of us that God has called us to be. There are three different types of people that come up to John after this message, after encountering him, and they all say the same thing. What should we do? The crowd, what should we do? And then you go read it. God, there was a, a unique, prophetic, clear vision that God gave to each group. Hey, crowd, this is what, I know there hasn't been no vision, there's been no voice, you guys have been wandering, but here's what God has called you to do, to the crowd. And then, next comes up, these, these tax collectors, they say the same thing, what should we do? And he gives them a, a clear prophetic vision. Hey, I know you haven't heard it in a long time, but here's what God wants you to do, tax collectors. And then they, even the soldiers come up, and he gives them a very specific prophetic vision for their life. This is what God wants you to do. Based upon their place and who they were, they received vision again. Why? Proverbs 29 and 18 tells us where there is no clear prophetic vision, the people do what they did. They wander astray. They wander. That word um, prophetic vision, in, in Hebrew, it's calzone. I'm not talking about the pizza right, right now. Some of you got hungry when I said that. You said, oh, that sounds good. Get some pepperoni, extra cheese on that thing. Stop it. Come back to me. Come back to me. All right? That's not cow zone, cow zone, okay? Cow zone. What it means, a, it's a divine dream. Some translations say dream. Some translations say vision or revelation. It literally means a divine dream, divine vision for your life. Like God, God has a clear prophetic vision for his people. Do you know that? Like for, for his church, God, there is, a, there is a clear vision for his kingdom and his church, but there is also a clear prophetic vision, a calzone for your life. That's the uniqueness that is you, how God created you, what God put inside of you. There is a, a calzone. And what I want to do today is to help you discover that. I want to help you connect to your calzone. You can get calzones later. I'm going to connect you to your calzone, the unique revelation. It was not supposed to be a mystery. It's not. not. Not now. Maybe then, before John the Baptist, but after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, now we have the impartation of the Holy Spirit, and, and the mind of God is made available to us. Now it's available to you to have this unique revelation of who you are and what God has called you to be. Let me give you three questions. Three questions, and I'm going to show you how they fit together. Three questions to ask yourself, because no one can tell you who you, no one can tell you what God's calzone, his dream is for your life, except for you. Let me give you some questions today to kind of navigate you there. Here's the first question, is what are your core values? What are your core values. A lot of people don't think about this, but think about it this way. Like, what do you stand for? What's important to you? What matters to you most? What gets you excited? What motivates you? What are you passionate about? And I decided a long time ago, you guys, that my values would be God's values, not the world's values. So whatever is in the word of God, whatever God values, I value. I don't value, I, I don't value the world's values. I value God's values. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 says this, our responsibility is never to oppose the truth, but to stand for the truth at all times. Now, all of us should be doing that, but there are some truths that stir you more than other truths. Now, all of God's values, they, they're valuable to me, but there is just some of them 
that stir you, excite you, motivate you more than others, that you are passionate about? What are your core values? That's important to understanding how God has created you, how he has wired you specifically because he put that there. What motivates you may not motivate me. This doesn't make me wrong or you wrong. It doesn't make either of us wrong or right. It makes us unique. Amen, somebody? Okay, here's the second question you have to ask yourself in order to get to your calzone, and that is, what are your spiritual gifts? What are, the Bible says that each of us in Christ have been given a spiritual gift, and it's not random. It's part of God's master plan to reach the world for him. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Notice it, it, it says different three times, Under, underscoring that you are unique. That's what that means. Each of us has a unique gift on our life that God has specifically given us. And, and your spiritual gift actually reveals a lot about your purpose. It reveals a lot about your calzone, your, your unique God dream, the vision of your life, because God has deposited inside of you the gifts that you need to fulfill the calling on your life. It really it gives a lot of direction to us to understand our spiritual gifts. In, in the scriptures, there's a few different places that talk about spiritual gifts. In, this cha- in, in 1 Corinthians, it goes over seven different types of spiritual gifts, and it's not exhaustive. It's not like, hey, these are the only gifts that there are. But there are the gifts that he mentions. Some, some scholars call them the motivational gifts of the Spirit. There's seven of them. And someone wrote something to kind of distinguish the different uh, uh, gifts of the Spirit. They said this, and this isn't mine, but I found this. It was really cool. It says, if each of the seven spiritual gifts were represented in a family and somebody dropped the dessert on the floor at the dinner table, here's what each person would say according to their giftedness. Okay, so the gift of mercy would say, oh, don't feel bad. It could have happened to anybody. So that's your response sometimes when things happen, if you have the gift of mercy. If you have the gift of preaching, then you'd say, that's what happens when you're not careful. That's messed up, huh? (laughs) Oh, preachers, man, they're messed up. The gift of serving would say, oh, let me help you clean that up, right? And that's how some of you respond. God did that. The gift of teaching would say, well, the reason it fell is because the weight distribution was... See, next time, let me give you three ways that you can carry that differently next time, okay? You just like to explain things, the gift of teaching. The gift of exhortation would say, next time, let's serve the dessert with the meal. It'll be all right. You just like to encourage people, exhort, okay? The gift of giving would say something like, I'll be happy uh, to pay for the new dessert. That's okay, okay? And some of you respond that way. The gift of administration would say, Jim, you get the mop. Sue, you pick it up. Mary, will you help me kind of make some more dessert here? All of it, all of it, none of it's right or wrong. All of it is unique. All of it is different. All of them are necessary for the body of Christ. That was part of his design. See, it was God's design that some of us, he would give the gift, the ability to to set up, to organize, to, to teach, to, you know, Uh, to be with kids and to be excited about kids' ministries or to play an instrument. God did all of that according to his master plan and his design. It was his plan. And in Matthew chapter, it's not in your notes, but in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells this parable. It's called the parable of the talents. And he tells this whole parable just to get to this point. And the point of the parable, Jesus says, at the end of your life when you're standing before God, he's going to ask you this question. What did you do with what I gave you? It's the whole point of the parable. We're going to stand before God, and God is going to say, I gave you, I deposited in you gifts. What did you do with what I gave you? And, and I think about that, like what would happen? Well, only God knows that like the spiritual explosion that would happen in this church and in our city if every single one of us here would discover, develop, and use the gifts that God has given us. Can you imagine what would happen if all of us were in touch with the, who, the gifts that, God, that we would discover, develop those things, and use them? I'm telling you, there would be an explosion in our city and in our church if we all just were faithful to the gifts that God has given us. Here's, here's the third question. The third question, if you want to know your calzone, the God dream, the unique dream that God has in your life, the third question is, what are your unique experiences? your unique experiences, and, and where some of us think like, you know what, I got some things that already, 
in my past disqualify me. Look, God can even use the, the ugly stuff, the bad stuff, the hurt, all that stuff. He can use all of the experiences and turn it around for his glory. Every one of those experiences, it makes you, you. When you, bring, when you don't try to hide them and, and you're ashamed of them, but you bring them for God, he will redeem every experience that you have had. Every pain, every hurt, every choice, he will redeem it for his glory. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It actually tells us this, that we know that in all things, everything, everything you experience, every pain, every hurt, people did to you or you did to them, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And that's key. Those who have been called according to his purpose. See, when you are, when you are living your cow's own, when you are called by God and living according to his purpose and plan for your life, that God dream, he says, everything that you experience, everything in your life, I will turn it around and I will cause it to work for good. It'll work for good for you. It'll work for good to the people around you if you're called according to my purposes. What are your unique experiences? These three questions. Let me, let me give you a little diagram. It's in your, in your outline there. And to show you kind of how this all works out, there's three circles on your, should be in your, in your handout. These three circles, they represent the three questions. That first circle represents your spiritual gifts. Here's, here's where we start. This is where, if you don't know, oh, what's, what's my, what's the revelation? What's the vision? What's the dream? What's the cow's own of my life? Here's where you start. Just know your gifts that God has given you and just start using them. Anywhere within that sphere, just just, if God has given you the gift to teach, teach. Just do it. Oh, I don't know where. I don't know when. Just teach. If God has given you the gift to serve, mercy, give, exhort, whatever it is, just be faithful with the gifts that God has given you. That's it. And we have our next step classes, by the way, at Discovery, are designed to help you discover the gifts that God has given you and connect you to the dream team and ministry to use those gifts. We make it so easy. If you want to know your God dream, and do it, discover, develop, and use it, take the next steps at discovery. They start next Sunday. Step one does. But that's where you start. But then you add to that your core values, your core values. So like what is, what is the, the core value point, Sean? Yeah, thank you. The core, what is, what is your, what excites you? What, are you? what are you passionate about? See, once you can discover that, now you see there's an overlap. You see that, you guys? There's an overlap there. So now, not only am I using my gift, but I'm combining my spiritual gift with my passions, with my motivations, with what is most important to me. And now I get this overlap where, man, I can actually combine that. I can, I can use my gift in an area of my passion, in an area that excites me. But then there's, there's the, there is the calzone spot. There is the place of God's vision and dream where you add on top of that your unique experiences. And as you can see, the overlap the overlap gets smaller. That right there is the cow's own spot. When you can combine your unique experiences, your core values, and the gifts God gave you, that is God's dream for your life. That is the unique you. And the cool thing about this is that your unique experiences, those experiences of your life, they're constantly changing because you're, you're constantly experiencing more and more. So how it worked out in my life, for instance, I didn't come from a church background, a religious background, spiritual background, none of that. It was very chaotic, dysfunctional, um, addictions, it just broken family, uh, you know, the ghetto. It just that's where that's where I came from. So when I when I got saved, God used that experience. So I, was, I got called to the street, man. I was an evangelist. I was ministering in the street to people that were broken and lost and hurting. I was out in front of the bars and stuff. I was just, that's how God used me uniquely. But then as, as I walked with God and my experiences grew and, and I got you know, experience in leadership and a degree in leadership and sat under amazing pastors that were able to mentor me, what I'm doing now is the, is the culmination and the explosion of my spiritual gifts, core values, and unique experiences. That's what I am doing now. So this is how it works out for my life. My spiritual gifts are, are leadership, faith, evangelism, that's, that's my, and teaching. Those are, my, that, those are my spiritual gifts. So that's what I, what I did. That's the first thing I did. Oh, that's my gift. So I started teaching Bible studies. I started witnessing and evangelizing, and that's who I was. I started doing that. I started leading within the body of Christ, within the level that, that I could. And then you add to that my core values. Mine, my core values, integrity, humility, 
family, and excellence. Those are, those, those, I'm passionate about that. That's what stirs me up. Those are my core values. And then my experiences, that, look, that just culminates into the dream that I am living right now. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a street evangelist. God has a unique calzone for your life. He's got it. There's a unique vision for your life. Here's the question I want you to ask yourself, you guys. Last feeling here. God has created me with a unique dream for my life, and I think it might be. Hey, would you take a step of faith even today and allow God to lead you? What, is, what do you think that cow zone might be? What, and if you don't know what it is yet, you're on the journey with all of us. You can discover it right here. That's why we actually called this church Discovery. It's the reason, because we lead people to discover God but discover who they are in Christ. Come on, let's bow our heads all across the